Hi there. I'm the director for our New Zealand registered not-for-profit <clears throat> charitable educational trust called Common Knowledge. And I was privileged in the early 1970s <clears throat> to work with hundreds of fathers and mothers, and we developed what are called the Birthing Better Skills that are inside our New Zealand charitable trust. <clears throat> I don't know why whenever I start this, I feel like I want to cough. So today I want to talk to you about posterior babies. I mean, there's something remarkable about having lived as long as I have and having been involved in the childbirth conversation. We don't often get to live through different trends, different evidence-based practice, and we don't often pay attention to those things even if they change because we're focused on ourselves and we're not focused on the bigger picture. I was always focused on the bigger picture because the childbirth conversation that was going on in 1970 when I gave birth wasn't making sense then, and it continued to make less and less sense as we went into the 80s where the famous childbirth authors um, sort of had this huge influence on where we are today. And so when COVID came along, I decided that I needed to come out of sort of 25 years of being quiet and start to speak about why we are so confused around childbirth and what is it that we could have done when I gave birth in 1970 and what didn't get done and what should be done now. And to make that change, we need more than me involved. We just need you whether you're pregnant or know somebody who's pregnant or a birth professional who works with lots of pregnant clients, you actually have more influence because you can start to heal the wounds that were created in the 60s and the 70s and, and made worse in the 1980s. And why is that? Because in 1970 in the United States, the first childbirth preparation classes were being taught and they were Lamas almost in every hospital, and the Bradley Method, which were sort of more upmarket. But they were called husband coach childbirth. We had wanted fathers to come in. They were just coming in. The cesarean rate was 4.5%. If you had risks involved in childbirth, that was considered to be normal. And so you just labored and had a vaginal birth, whether we labored for hours or days or whether we coped well or whether we suffered, whether we had a good outcome or whether we had a tragedy. And so the conversations today about things like posterior babies, that wasn't a conversation that my generation or previous generations around the world had. We didn't have ultrasounds back then <clears throat> and we weren't concerned because there wasn't anything that we could really do except to be given pain relief or and or to um, have doctors use forceps and episiotomies, and rarely, 4.5%, rarely use cesareans only in case my life as a mother was really at risk. So how did we get here, and how do, where do we go from here? Because right now, women with posterior babies are really treating it as though it's a risk. And if they weren't treating as a risk, they wouldn't be spending so much time standing on their head in optimal fetal positioning and trying to get their baby to turn. So today I really want to talk about the skills that mothers and fathers developed so that we could impact our individual births. The skills are very broad because I might have a posterior baby and you might not. My posterior baby might be quite small and I might have a very ample pelvis and your head down baby might have a blockhead like your, you have or your husband has and you may not know that you have quite a narrow pelvis or that you're very tight in your vagina. I might not have back labor with my posterior baby because my baby fits easily through my body and you might have terrible back labor because you're a blockheaded kid that only weighs five pounds but has a very broad diameter here um, and it coming into a small pelvis and you might have a very broad straight uh, sacrum and it pushes on it in order to make space. So we need to understand that posterior babies were never considered to be a risk ever until 
the mid 1980s. And this is how posterior babies got to be considered unideal. In the United States, in the 50s, they outlawed midwives. That was not true in other countries. They were well integrated into the maternity system. In the United States, it was labor and delivery nurses. But there were people who were doing births. There were obstetricians doing births, general practitioners, um, Vietnam paramedics that were doing births. There were lay midwives and uh, nurses that were doing births. And uh, every state had its own thing. So some states, it wasn't legal to have a home birth. Some states didn't care. Some states, if you were a nurse, it was considered to be illegal to be doing midwifery. It was all very up in the air. But the midwives of that day, who were beginning to follow Ina Mae Gaskin's beliefs that midwives were this sort of, this special group of people, which we have to ask whether that's any rea reality. So in India, the dyes um, are the untouchables. So they're not considered to be special. They can handle feces and blood products that upper classes don't touch. So the midwives were the lowest of low castes uh, around the world. In, in most cultures, there were no midwives. It was your aunt or your mother or your grandmother. So when the first wave of this new modern midwifery came about, this, there was this belief that midwives were first born into this. They're not. It's an occupation. It's a job. You may love it, but you're not born to it. And you, doing it doesn't mean that you have any greater insights than anybody else does. You may develop greater insights because you're attending lots of births, but there are midwives that I've seen practice that have absolutely no insights but consider themselves to be ideal midwives because they give continuity of care to women, but they have no understanding of the body. And so what they do is allow women to labor unendingly because they assume that a woman knows how to birth, which we know. No, we don't. We don't know how to have good sex. <laughs> we, we don't know what foods are safe or poisonous unless we're taught. We don't know how to cook well unless we learn how to cook. So somewhere along the line, this you never know what's going to happen at your birth became women know how to birth. We never have known how to birth just because we get pregnant. We never know what our birth's going to be like. So the posterior births were just a non-entity. As I said, we didn't have ultrasounds. Could you tell always what position a baby was in? Are you constantly checking positions? You went to an obstetrician once a month and then every two weeks and then once a week and then you went in labor and if they knew you had a posterior baby, you had a posterior baby. And if you didn't, you didn't. And if you didn't know, you didn't know. But 99.9% .9 of all posterior babies do turn. Very few of them are born sunny side up. So when we were dealing with posterior babies back in the forever, then something happened in the 80s, particularly in the United States, with this new concept of continuity of care midwifery, which was always sort of insane because you're a human being who's willing to be at somebody else's birth. And if you're willing to be there for 24, or 36 or 48 hours, you're not with your family you're not taking care of yourself and you're not making yourself available to other people you're working with. So this concept that women should have this midwife with them, um, now it's a doula, it is, and for a while it was a father, right? but uh, the natural birth movement de demoted dads from my generation in 1970 to when I gave birth in 1982 from coaches to support people. So in the 80s, what you started to hear from midwives in the United States was, oh, I've just been at the longest birth. Oh my God, it was long. Oh my God, she had back labor. Oh, it just went on for hours and days. And it was a posterior baby. And so from that, actually, several things sprung up one was doulas, right? Because midwives started to say, I don't know if I want to be at a birth for 24, 36 hours. Right on, girls. No, you don't. And you shouldn't, right? The woman's family should be skilled enough to help her. 
And if you think, just in case, there's a problem, then she should be under constant medical supervision, shouldn't she? Because if there's a real risk to her or her baby, then it's appropriate to get medical care. So if you don't think there's a problem, then there doesn't seem to be a problem, or even if there was, because people having heart problems aren't standing in the hospital waiting room or when we have a car accident or a stroke. Right? So childbirth has been infinitely consumed upward into something that says women can't do this, and women certainly can't do this on their own, which is goes against the reality, which is a pregnant woman is always doing the birth on her own, no matter where she's birthing or who she's birthing with or how many people are in the room, because she can't not do it. She can't not be pregnant. She can't not do the birth. So we're all doing the birth on our own, which means all of us, we need to become skilled. And so this talk is really going to be about the skills that we need if we have a posterior baby. But let me tell you a secret, they're the same skills we need if we have a head down baby or twins or breeches. Because the reality is, is that we have a big object that has to open up our body and come down through and out. If we do not know what our container is offering this object, we don't know if this container is going to make it easier or harder for this object to do its work. So what Birthing Better Families did was start to develop skills. We first focus on the coping better with the natural occurring pain of labor contractions because Lamaze and Bradley skills worked for some but didn't work for many. And they were really only targeting low-risk women, of which a posterior pregnancy was considered to be low-risk then. Breaches weren't, twins weren't, a lot of other things weren't. And the Bradley and Lamaze and Grantley Dick Reed in New Zealand, where our trust is, were focused not only on low-risk women, but three very narrow goals, which is a natural birth in which nobody defined the word natural. I mean, the reality is, Dead mother or dead baby is natural. A woman ripping from her vagina through her rectum is natural. Having a severe postpartum bleed is natural. So what's a natural birth? So that word got co-opted or switched or twisted into safe and easy, good outcome and manageable. And that's never been what it's meant. So not enough women achieved that. And not enough women achieved the pain-free labor or the childbirth without fear that Grantley Dick Reed advocated, because we're hardwired to feel anxious about birth. And that's a good thing, it's a gift. And I think it's in number two of this series that I explain about the gift of fear, because we become observant if we're frightened about something and we pay more attention. And then we should seek help if we need help, or we should st still be observant. And this helps us when we have a baby, because babies can't tell us. So when we have developed the gift of fear, then we're more likely to look at the baby and not go, what's the matter? Rather than go, do I think there's something the matter? And if not, let me start to think about what the baby needs. So the reality is, is that when we started to work with um, developing the skills, we had the first childbirth classes ever being taught that were focused on a natural birth, pain-free labor with no medical interventions. So the word interventions wasn't used back then. They were assessments, monitoring procedures. And if you didn't want any of those, then don't go near a doctor or a hospital because they have an obligation, a duty. It's called standards of care. It could be evidence-based practice. It could be guidelines to practice, whatever you call it. And the doctor in the hospital may have different ones. That's involved with now insurance payments and stuff like that in the United States. But elsewhere, that's what it is. Midwives, even home birth midwives, have standards of care. And if they move outside of that too much, and I've known a number of midwives over the past 50 years who constantly moved outside of what was common sense, and many of them then lost their licenses because things happened that, were, that might have been prevented had this concept that natural birth meant 
that women should just go on and 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 on. And, on. and in 1970, basically, that's what we did. <laughs> we just went on and on and on and on um, because cesareans were so rare. So this posterior birth thing and posterior baby, first of all, if you don't know what the hole in your pelvis is like and you have no relative feeling of how big your baby is into that hole, then you have no idea at all <laughs> what's going on. So you need to find out. And so when we stopped focusing on developing skills to cope with the natural occurring pain and we started to develop skills to open the body for birth because fathers got it. It was like an exercise in plumbing. Big object has to open up, move down through and out this container. How do I open up the container? Let me add it, show me how, will do. So dads develop most of the body skills because honestly, we as women tend to be quite disconnected from our body. And the way we knew that was a simple test. Okay, stood a woman and a man next to each other and we said to them, this thing, the size of a grapefruit, has to come out through your body. For men, they look down at their penis and they think of this thing coming through their penis and they go, oh shit, right? Women, it's inside our body. So we don't have that visual cueing. And most of us, even us who believe we know our bodies well, really don't have any idea. So if I just said to you, what does five centimeters feel like? You'd go, huh? Right, you, right, you would go, huh? We'd all go, huh? And the only, those of us who don't go, huh, are the ones who stick our fingers up our crotch and feel for an arc of the cervix. And if the arc is like that, that's about five centimeters. It's about five centimeters, which is, right? So that's 10 centimeters. So if we feel it, then we know it. If we don't feel it, we just have no idea. When so a doctor or midwife says to you, your baby's engaged or it's at a zero station, what's that mean? If you don't know what that feels like in your body, you have no reference point. <clears throat> and posterior babies are just like any other baby. It's an object coming through a container. So you need to know what the shape of your container is like. And that's the bony structure first and then all the soft tissue that surrounds it. The inlet of the pelvis we can't feel because that's on top of the pubic bone going back to the sacrum and we can't get our fingers in there. Nobody can. But our baby has to come down through that. So we can't really identify that. Even if you have a high baby, one who hasn't come into the inlet of the pelvis, you don't know whether the inlet is, is the problem or whether you just have so much tension in your lower belly or something, very, very short cord, or a placenta place, some place so the baby, or the cord's wrapped around the baby. You don't know, right? Even with an ultrasound, you don't know. So the mid-pelvis, you actually can feel, but you have to have somebody get their fingers up in you, that's your partner, because you can't feel it. Even if you feel for the cervix, you're just putting one finger up. And when we feel ourselves, we can only feel the very, very front of, the, of that space because our vagina is at the very front of the space and our rectum is in the middle of the space and our sacrum is in the back of the space. But if we lie on our back and our partner does the internal work, prepares the inside of our vagina and softens all that soft tissue, when they go in with one finger to do that, they can feel the curve, the, let me put your hands up here, okay, they can feel what the inside of the pelvis is like. And no pelvis is symmetrical. They're never both like this or like this. They're always a little differently shaped. And your baby will always go to the easiest place it can. And all of that is covered with soft tissue and muscles. And if those are tight, then it's harder for that bony structure to open up if the object is big enough to require it to do that. So to, in order to know what the space of our pelvis is, we have to measure it. You you'd find the beginning part of your vagina, which is at the pubic bone, and you measure back to your tailbone. And if you can get your fist through that space, then that's about the size of a baby's head. And then the bones you sit on, if you can get your fist between that space, 
then that's about the size of baby head. And about 50% of women have pretty much a fairly circular space, right? But some women are narrower between the sit bones and longer front to back. And some women are narrower front to back and wider side to side. And so our baby will then get into our, fit into our body based on what it has to come through. So we have to know how to identify our space and we need to know how to identify the shape of our sacrum because that's the bone the baby will move out if it needs more space. So one of the things about a posterior baby is that the head doesn't tuck as well because the back is arching to the curve of our back. So a posterior baby is presenting a wider dimension through its head, through our inlet, mid pelvis, and out the outlet, and into the vagina if it stays posterior and doesn't turn. So to know the length of the sacrum, the width of it, how curved or flat it is, is important. Because we're constructing this space in our minds, and then we have to be able to mobilize it. And this is why dads really got it. So for instance, we as women have given each other incredibly faulty information, and we still do. It's actually worse now. It's incredibly worse now than it was in the 70s. The 70s, the only one we really were given was to do pelvic floor, to hold back your pee, tighten up inside to make strong muscles so you'd have strong muscles to push your baby out. Tighten up down there now. Does that help or hinder this to come through? Well, common sense says it hinders it. So pelvic floor exercises are great for any time in life except from 24 weeks of pregnancy until after the birth. We need to be opening up, not tightening up. But then when back labors started to be dealt with, not because they were a problem, just because they were long exhausting labors for some women, was this idea that you put counter pressure on the sacrum for hours forcefully, which does what to the space the baby's trying to create? Yes, it's pain relief for the woman, and she can hinder her labor for hours and hours because it just makes it harder and harder and harder for the baby. So we needed to learn to mobilize the pelvis. And if you're sitting there listening to me now, you can mobilize your pelvis just sitting down. Just tuck your tail t between your legs a little bit more. You'll feel the muscles from your sit bone to your lower sacrum contract, which shuts off that lower space, doesn't it? but it opens up the top space of the inlet of the pelvis, doesn't it? And then if you rock your sacrum back a little bit without arching your back or without moving, so I'm doing that now, you can't see me do that. So if you rock that tailbone back, that lower part, you can feel those muscles expand. That's giving space to your baby down there. Once the baby is through the the inlet of the pelvis and the mid pelvis should give more space. And being able to mobilize your sacrum may not reduce the back labor entirely, but you are then working with your baby's efforts to move down through and out your body appropriately rather than putting compression on the sacrum, which is helping you feel better, but not helping the baby. And the other one is hands and knees. The idea was to get the baby out of the pelvis why do you want to do that? And that's where it gets crazy. Why do you want to do that? And the common is, well, it gives babies an option to turn. Well, some do and some don't. And some only turn a little bit, or some babies go very asynclitic. Now, asynclitic is that the baby isn't straight on coming down, okay? It's actually tilted a little bit. But that tilt can also be due by what you don't know, which is what is that mid pelvis like? So some women have a quite a, a part of their mid pelvis that's quite like that, and the other kind of like that, right? And so the baby's going to head to this, and that's going to make the head a little bit asynclitic, isn't it? Because that space in there isn't symmetrical. 
And babies aren't up and down anyway. They're diagonal. Because when you look at a pelvis and you see the sacrum back there and the tailbone, those are two big mouse ears and then that. So the baby comes in at this diagonal and the posterior baby's coming into that back diagonal. So if you know the shape of your pelvis and if you can open up those muscles and keep your mo sacrum mobile, then you work with your baby's efforts to be born. And you want labor contractions to move along. You want every contraction to start to go up to peak, start to go away, and then go away. An ineffective labor contraction is one that starts, it starts to go up and then just plateaus off. And we know whether we're having an effective contraction. We all know it. There isn't one woman who doesn't know whether that contraction was effective or not. And we know if we have ineffective contractions, we'll say it. I've been doing this for hours. There's no change. You're right. There is no change. And effective contractions are what? They're progressive labors. So our job as a woman is to work with our baby's efforts to open us up to move down through and out our pelvis. And if it were posterior, then we want to really help because our baby is not as tucked, and so a wider dimension is coming through us. Now, when I gave birth, I went to see an obstetrician, and um, he checked my pelvis, and he proudly said to me, you can get a freight train through there. And I thought to myself, interesting compliment. Right? What he was saying to me was, and, you know, your baby would have to be gigantic not to be able to get through you. I have family members who have delivered 12-pound babies very, very, very easily. Right Now, one of my children was 5 pounds, a small little 8-week premature baby. But a 5-pound baby has a fairly normal size head. And a nine or 10 pound baby can have the same dimensions. And some of it comes from your genetics. If you're people that have, are narrow here at the widest point, these parietal bumps here, and your baby is, is like you, then your baby can be very big in its body, but not have any trouble getting its head through. You can have a small baby, a three pound baby, that baby's head is kind of like that, a blockhead. And it can struggle, particularly if you have a small pelvis or a tight pelvis. And it has nothing to do with how tall you are. There are many women who are under five feet who just very ample pelvises and spit kids out very easily. And there are women who have childbearing hips that actually have very small outlets. So you have to know. And if you don't know, then you can't effectively help your baby. So do you need to spend all this time standing on your head trying to get your baby into optimal fetal positioning? Totally up to you. I, I, we don't. Our trust doesn't have an opinion. I don't have an opinion. That's just up to you. What we want to tell you is what Birthing Better Families said, which is the concept around childbirth right now is to make choices about birth. And what we developed in the 1970s, which was possible, almost could happen if those three obstetricians had focused their skills on 100% of pregnant women who are going to give birth rather than on low-risk women, then we wouldn't be here today. So we want to reclaim that space and say that it's normal and natural when you're pregnant to self-learn birth and birth coaching skills and use those skills when you work through the activity of birthing your baby. In all circumstances, you get pregnant to have a baby, not a type of birth. And if you have skills, you'll birth better. It's as simple as that. If you're horny and you have skills to be a good lover, you're a better lover. If you're hungry and you know what foods to put in your mouth that are safe, you're less likely to get sick. And if you know how to cook, you're a winner. But somehow the people in my generation reduced birth down to a primal function, which it is already. It doesn't need to be reduced more, but they've kept it down there. They haven't elevated it to our capacity as human beings to be highly effective in skills. 
posterior, if you have a posterior baby, you should. You should for all births. Okay? And you need to know what positions, when you're birthing, your baby likes. Because your baby is giving you a message in each contraction. If your contraction peaks and goes away and you're having a progressive labor, your baby, whether it's posterior or not, is saying to you, Mom, you don't have any tension that's stopping me or hindering me. You're in a position I'm okay with, right? You're not compressing the inside space, right? And therefore, your labor is progressive. If your labor is not progressive, you either have internal tension that you're either aware of or not aware of, you're in positions that your baby doesn't, doesn't like, and, you, and or you're compressing the space. And it can sometimes be two or three of those things. And so you have to figure them out. And the way you figure them out is have a skilled birth coach, your husband or a friend. If you are using a doula, then teach her or him the skills that you are learning. But really, it should be within the family. Because if you are skilled in pregnancy and prepared, skilled to prepare for birth and skilled to birth your baby, you're going to be able to leave the birth behind and get on to being skilled to parent your child. That's true of the child's father or the other loved ones. If they become skilled in pregnancy and they're skilled to help you prepare your body and they help you skillfully to the birth of your baby, they will be skilled to work, to, to parent with you. So we want skilled families. And it's important. And it's important to do the internal work. For a long time, the natural birth movement said, now women stretch. But, hmm, yeah, hmm, yeah we can stretch and we can tear. And we cannot stretch fast enough, and we can hinder the baby's ability to get out of our body. And that can become a life-threatening problem to the baby, because babies are trying to breathe when they're coming down for the vagina. They want to get out. So if our crotches are tight, and that's why the medical profession used episiotomies and forceps, because they see our crotches, and they see lots of them. They, we don't have much perspective compared to how tight our crotch is compared to other women or what our baby wants. So for a while, there was this idea that you just want to prevent the ring of fire, that last passage, and do this small perineal stretching. But that's not where the problem lies. Tuck your tail again. Feel those muscles contract. Those are inside that space. So untuck your tail. Those expand. But in the back, when you're sitting there now, think about inside the back of your rectum. Think about each side of the back of your rectum. Think about between your rectum and your vagina. Think about all of that space inside your vagina. That's all packaged with soft tissues and muscles. And if that area is tight, then, and which is a problem because men like us tight, right? And we like to feel tight. But if we stretched or damaged down there, our body does not come back. But if for five minutes a day from 32 weeks onward, we do deep internal work, then we can prepare this last passage of the baby to open up easily and let the baby out. So these are some of the skills that you want as a posterior baby. As I said, we have no opinion whether you should try to turn your baby or not. What we would like to say to you is if you're spending half an hour a day doing optimal fetal position, spend half an hour a day developing skills to prepare your body and skills to cope with your birth. Equal time. Because the reality is you may or may not turn your baby. Turning your baby may or may not be a benefit for you and your baby. You still have to do the activity. And that activity takes place over time. And so you have to fill that time if you don't fill it with skills, then you're being passive. And if you're being passive, you're more likely not to cope or to feel overwhelmed. And if you're in a medical environment and you're looking overwhelmed, the medical profession doesn't want you to suffer. So they want 
to offer you pain relief. And if your labor goes on and on and on and on, then at some point they just think you're tired, your baby's tired, <clears throat> and they'd like to get the birth over with. <clears throat> and because in the 1990s, the natural birth movement started to say, forceps damage babies. Yes, they can. Why are doctors using forceps? Because we have not been taught how to prepare down there. There is no woman who is prepared down there that people on the receiving end doesn't see that because the baby comes down efficiently and there is no need to think of cutting the baby or using forceps. So when the natural birth movement started to say the medical profession, forceps can damage babies, medical profession knew that. They knew that. Nobody turned their focus on what we could do as women to prevent that. And this is why this is so shameful and why we need to have a new message. So instead of forceps and episiotomy, we had cesareans. We had more medical intervention. And here we are today. Even in New Zealand, where our trust is, where we have an absolutely wonderful midwifery model of care, free to the clients, we have a system that has never, never was going to be functional. We have 24-7 continuity of care, which means women just absorb the life energy of the midwives there. And we have a partnership model that less than 10% of midwives explain to women. So women don't know what it is. And those 10% that explain it to women say, we respect your choices. What do you want of me? That's not a partnership. That's a dependency model. I, as a woman, get to choose what I want for my birth, which is totally, totally, totally crazy because babies do not come to plan and there's no way to know what your birth's going to be like. A birth isn't a wedding. It is actually much more like having sex for three hours or 24 hours or 36 hours, right? If you know how to do that for that long length of time, then you do it. It's an activity that takes place over time. It's not a choice. You can choose things around it, right? But you cannot choose what your birth's going to be like and babies don't come to plan. So when birth unfolds, even in this wonderful New Zealand midwifery model, the cesarean rate's gone from 12% to 27, 28% in a generation. And midwives are tired. And the system isn't functional because they stuck to the ideology that got put in place in the 80s, which is that birth is all about choice. It's not about skills. And it's about low-risk women choosing to have no medical care. And that's unrealistic. In fact, it's so unrealistic that I want to show you what midwives have said to me when I've taught strengthening the partnership workshops. We ask midwives, what do you want for pregnant women? What do you want? In New Zealand, it's a midwifery model of care. 98% of women have midwives. Whether you have a posterior baby, twins, breaches, whether you have or seen an obstetrician, you can be a lead maternity care, and that woman can choose to have a home birth or a hospital birth, and you can attend her. So midwives are saying they want more women to have natural birth, and that undefined natural birth She's, all, she's right made. She'll come right made. And when you ask what's stopping that, it's this long list of interventions. So we as women have to avoid all of those things in order to achieve an image of a natural birth. And when we ask midwives, what is, what do you think an, an ideal birth is? This is what they say. So from birthing better families, what's an ideal birth? Ours. <laughs> we, we get pregnant to have a baby, right? We don't get pregnant to have an ideal birth. We want to have a safe birth. We want to have a healthy mother and a healthy baby. We don't want risks, which there are many 
to become problems, which are fewer. And we don't want those fewer problems to become those fewer tragedies. We don't want that. We want a self, safe and healthy mother and baby. That's primary. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants that. Whether you're a midwife, a doula, an obstetrician, labor and delivery nurses, mother, father, family, blah, blah. Everybody wants that. Okay? That's why we get frightened about birth. So listen to number two, and you'll understand the gift of fear. However, what's happened since the 70s and 80s has been this concept of an ideal birth. And here you go. This is what it is. And as I said in the middle of this, we as women have been doing this to each other. And this is what women are doing to each other. And that's why I'm speaking out now. It's not okay. COVID has changed everything. Whether you believe that it's real or not, it's changed everything. And it highlights the importance of this need to enliven a childbirth concept that should have been enlivened in the early 1970s, which is that it's normal and natural when you're pregnant to self-learn birth and birth coaching skills, and then use those skills to work through the activity of birthing your baby. You get to tell other people that. That's a simple statement. There are lots of skills-based methods out there. Birthing better is one of them. If you're a care provider, you tell that to all of your clients. And if you're really a good care provider, give them a handout of some of the skills-based methods. You can include birthing better if you want, but if you don't, that's up to you. And then if you're a birth professional and you know you're working with a posterior baby, explain to them that they're going to learn skills and every appointment after 24 weeks, you can just mark those skills on their notes so that everybody can be reminded of the skills they've learned. And so during the birth, if a woman is working effectively through that birth, and if it's a posterior birth, then praise her. And if the other person helping her is helping her, praise them. It's so much easier for you to work with skilled families. And if they look a little bit overwhelmed or very overwhelmed, refer back to the notes and say, you learned breathing. The woman might say, I said I did, but I didn't. Well, there you go. But if she did, why isn't she using those skills now? And she might say to you, well, something changed. And you go to your baby's birth. Keep using your breathing skills. It's hard. Just keep doing this activity. And you keep helping her do that activity to cope and manage and work through and deal with and handle and stay on top of and feel in control. Because the much bigger issue around childbirth has never been risks. It's always been suffering. And suffering has never had anything to do with risks. It has to do with women lacking the skills to cope with the natural, normal, physiological pain of labor contractions, whether you have a posterior baby or not. So can a posterior birth be longer? It's longer in unskilled women. <laughs> because when we're skilled, we respond more rapidly to the sensations that we are feeling. And we can tell whether our contractions are progressive or not. And because we develop skills to open our body, we are more likely to do that. Is it easy when you're feeling pain that feels like you could die? No. Labor is not easy. Hard work is not easy. And here's a clue. Parenting is not easy. Thankfully, birth is this long and parenting goes on and on and on. So if you have a posterior baby, we hope you'll become skilled. You can come to our website and take a look at our courses. We'd recommend for a posterior birth, you get the complete course, unless you're having a VBAC, in which we'd encourage you to get the VBAC course instead. So there you go, another one of my commentaries on deconfusing the childbirth message and you and your coming experience to birthing your baby. A posterior one or not, remember 99.9% .9 of them don't deliver sunny side up. See ya.